So some of the causes for upper gastrointestinal bleeding, some of it might seem repetitions for you guys, but bear with me, these repeating it probably is the best way to learn. So um, the most common cause for upper gastrointestinal bleeding usually is peptic ulcer disease. Anywhere for about, about 50%, one third to 50% of the cases are usually peptic ulcer disease, disease related. Uh, erosions are the second leading cause and uh, esophagitis, which is inflammation or break in the mucosa in the esophagus or esophagitis is another cause. Esophageal or gastric varices, these are also common causes, not as common as the peptic ulcer disease. Next one is a mallory wise tear where uh, you have a specific and clear cut history which leads you to the diagnosis of mallory wise tear. Uh, malignancies, AV malformation or vascular malformations are also other causes that constitute gastrointestinal bleeding and some rare causes which uh, you probably don't have to think too much about at this point are some of the rare causes, Osler Weber Rendo causes, Meckel's diverticulosis, radiation proctitis, and all these are some of the rarer causes, diverticulosis, all these are rarer causes for gastrointestinal bleeding. So um, when a patient presents with gastrointestinal bleeding with any of the forms that I mentioned before, what are some of the things you need to do? First and foremost, a good history is of primary importance. So good history should be taken during resuscitation and it should not be taken instead of resuscitation. So resuscitation is probably more important than uh, uh, the history taking itself. So in the elderly patients, uh, once they come in, uh, you know, the elderly patients, you need to remember, they tend to bleed more from lesions that are less common in younger patients, especially diverticulosis, ischemia, ischemic colitis is more common in the elderly. Cancer is more common in the elderly. Uh, you also need to remember that young patients usually bleed from the Meckel's diverticula. Uh, so some of the history points, uh, age, you know, that's the reason why it's important when a patient comes with gastrointestinal bleeding. Prior history of gastrointestinal bleeding also is important. If they have a prior history of peptic ulcer disease that bled and they come back again with melino or with hematemesis, chances are that you could be bleeding from the same etiology. I'm just reading some of the chat questions I was getting. So the next, um, hereditary telangiectasias. So someone has a history of osler weber rendau disease. So you need to remember they can have telangiectasias through their colon. So that should be something that could be kept in mind. Elderly patients with a prior history of diverticular bleeding, they come in with massive lower gastrointestinal bleeding, then you should need to be thinking about diverticulosis as one of the cause. Prior history of surgery also as a part of the history taking is important because an aortic graft or a tumor history, which leads towards the diagnosis should be thought of also. So as a part of the initial assessment, along with the history, you have to assess the severity of bleeding also in the patient. First, um, you need to carefully record or monitor the vital signs, which are the blood pressure of the patient, the heart rate, the pulse, the respiratory rate, the oxygen saturation. These are some of the things you need to, uh, you know, uh, start or get uh, a measure of. Then you resuscitate the patient. How do you resuscitate the patient? You start the patient on oxygen therapy because the, it's the the blood which has the, which carries the oxygen to different parts of the body. So you need to, uh, you know, assess the patient and start giving him oxygen. Start two large bore IV lines for fluid resuscitation, volume resuscitation, because majority of them go into hypovolemic shock, depending on the severity of the bleeding. So you replace volume, IV fluids, Ringer's lactate, normal saline, colloids, plasma, FFPs, blood products, any of these are volume replacement. Then you get a chest x-ray to see if there's any other cause, if there's any baseline pulmonary edema, so that you cannot, you don't have to drown the patient in fluids. And you need to carefully monitor the hemodynamics and electrolyte management, transfuse blood when indicated. And you know, also you get a GI score. So when a patient comes in, a resuscitation, it's a, it's a funny description, although shouldn't be using the funny over here, uh, but uh, it's a description where, you know, resuscitation takes uh, precedence. The ABCs probably are more important than anything else in a patient first. So we use this score called the Rockal score, scoring system for risk to determine the risk of rebleeding and death after admission to hospital in cases of, in case of acute gastrointestinal bleeding. So um, what are some of the parameters that we use in Rockal score are the age, the age of the patient, whether the, patient, whether the patient is in shock or not, the comorbidities of the patient, whether they have any significant comorbidities such as you know, cardiac, cardiac failure, is, ischemic heart disease, renal, renal failure, liver failure, malignancy, or any, or any of those uh, comorbidities. 
um, you know, um, also signs of recent hemorrhage also are important when you uh, do the endoscopy, uh, such as an adherent clot, such as a visible or spurting vessel. All these are signs of recent hemorrhage, and they also add to the ROCAL score. So the scoring is uh, probably at your level. You don't need to know much about the scoring system. So um, this is how an actual uh, GI bleeding score uh, looks like. And I'll tell you later on what the score means and how you need to interpret it. So a score of um, less than three is usually associated with an excellent prognosis. Okay, that's the Rockell score. So the risk of re-bleeding is much lower in them um, as opposed to a score of greater than eight is associated with a higher risk of death and higher risk of re-bleeding. Um, in liver disease though, the prognosis is mainly related to the severity of the liver disease rather than the, just the sheer magnitude of uh, the bleeding because there are other things, several things that go on in liver disease, not just the GI bleeding, which determines the risk of death, but uh, the risk of malignancy, risk of portal hypertension induced, other issues such as hepatic, hepatic encephalopathy is another thing, SBP is another thing. There's some of the things that determine the, um, uh, the death in the, those patients. So along with doing the ABCs, resuscitation of the patient, getting a good history, you also need to do some initial assessment, which would be, is the patient a no case of known liver disease? So what are some of the things? Based on this, you can actually determine the different etiologies and, and you know, it narrows down your etiology and your diagnosis also. So you need to know whether the patient has known liver disease, whether the patient has been taking NSAIDs, uh, the, Adv the Advil, Ali, Motrin, Ibuprofen, Naproxen, all these NSAIDs, they tend to increase your risk of bleeding. So you need to get a good history uh, when, you do the patient, when you do the patient assessment. You know, if the patient also had associated abdominal pain when they had this bleeding, abdominal pain leads more towards an ulcer or ischemia of the colon, mesenteric ischemia or malignancy also are higher in patients who have abdominal pain. History of retching, you know, when they have malary wise tear causes persistent, when you have persistent vomiting and retching, the diagnosis can, an alcoholic patient, who had a binge of alcohol, had several episodes of vomiting. Along with that, they also had several episodes of retching, comes in with hematemesis along with vomiting. So it should lead you towards a diagnosis of Mallory Weiss tear. I've had a change in bowel habits or anorexia, weight loss, loss of appetite and all these. They should suspect malignancy as a cause. So more and more assessment will tell you uh, more a little bit more about the possible diagnosis in these patients. It'll also help you fasten the uh, resuscitation process. So along with doing the history, getting a good history, assessing the patient, getting a good you know, physical assessment and the vitals and giving resuscitation, you need to assess the patient for the physical characteristics, which could be specific to certain uh, diseases. You know, uh, the skin, which probably is the biggest organ, uh, is probably the mirror to your uh, healthy status. So spider nevi, when they're present over the abdomen, uh, usually a hyperestrogenic state common in liver cirrhosis patients. So the spider nevi are nothing but blood spots that are present usually over the abdomen or over the chest, uh, common in uh, chronic liver disease, CLD patients, still angiectasias. Hyperpigmentation is common, especially on the lips and everything in patients with Puge Jaeger's uh, syndrome. So on the abdomen, what do you see? Um, Hepatosplenomegaly could be a presenting feature, especially in someone you're suspecting portal hypertension. Ascites is something you need to remember. Caput medice, these are blood vessels that are swollen over the anterior abdominal wall. Abdominal tenderness could be present in someone who has ascites or SBP, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. You can actually feel an abdominal mass, which could be a malignancy, or it could be a large splenomegaly or hepatomegaly, which is an enlarged liver. All these can have present with uh, acute abdominal discomfort. Lymphadenopathy could be present also.